Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome to the stream. Uh, today we're going to do a bunch of different problems. They're listed at the bottom of the, uh, the screen. And uh, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's online for this. Zero people watching. Oh, okay, so if people will start watching, uh, you can ask questions. Um, so today's, today's uh, assignment is a lot of, um, a lot of kind of simpler questions. Uh, that involve the uh, putting a lot of what we know about electromagnetism together. Um, so there's some Faraday's law, uh, there's a little bit of Ohm's law, that kind of jazz. So let's start. <clears throat> uh, so the first question I want to do is 29.17. So it's chapter 29 in your black book, question 17. It goes, the long straight wire in figure blah carries a current I that varies as time goes I naught sine omega T and the loop wire is held stationary near the straight wire. Uh, when is the induced current in the loop clockwise? When is it zero? When is it counterclockwise? Um, I'm not sure what it looks like in your, um, in your textbooks, uh, so is the current sine omega t okay and here's our loop <clears throat> okay um so let me let me draw everything with respect to a current going up um this will generate according to the right hand rule a magnetic field like this so it'll be going around like that b um, so it'll be passing into like that. Okay. Uh, for now, when the current's going up, uh, the current as a function of time, uh, we can draw it as a graph. I'm going to use this graph to, to answer my question. Like I said, I don't know what it looks like on the assignment. It might use actual numbers. Um, so at t is equal to zero, it's going to go up and then down and then up and then down, right? And it's going to take, I don't know, uh, 2 pi. So this is the t axis, 2 pi over omega. Did you get that far? <laughs> oh man, it's got a poor stream health. Uh, hold on. Let me see if I can do something. Oh, geez. <clears throat> All right. Okay, I think we're live again. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so where was I? Right, uh, the current's gonna go up and down and up and down and up and down like that. Um, I'm gonna divide this into into a couple different parts. Um, so. Let's cut this time interval into four parts here. Okay. So for this part of the time, um, for that time interval, uh, the current is going upwards. But for the first part of it, the magnetic field is increasing. And for the second part, it's decreasing. Right? So when the magnetic field here, its strength is increasing, uh, Lenz's law says it's going to make a current that cancels it out, which corresponds to going like that. So for this part, when it's increasing in strength, Lenz's law says 
that's going to induce a magnetic field of the opposite direction, uh, and then it's going to go uh, in the in the loop. The current is going to uh, I'll, I'll call it I loop. I loop is counterclockwise. Okay. Um, for the second part of this, boop, boop, boop. Um, the magnetic field is still pointing into the page, uh, but the strength of the magnetic field, so for this time interval here, um, the strength is decreasing. Okay, So as it decreases, uh, Lenz's law says, oh, I want to get that magnetic field back. And... Um, and Lenz's law says the loop is going to generate a current that replaces the missing magnetic field strength, which is that way. So for this time interval, I is uh, clockwise. Um, then for this time interval here, uh, the magnetic field is pointing down through. So the, the current is going in the opposite direction. And so the magnetic field is going to go in the opposite direction. So the magnetic field here, I guess I should do it in red. Boop, boop. The magnetic field generated by the wire, the straight wire, is going to be pointed like this. And it's going to be increasing in strength. So during that time, um, the the mag Lenz's law says it's going to generate a current to cancel out that strengthening magnetic field. So it's going to go that way, which is a current going in that direction, which is clockwise again. And then so for this last time interval before the cycle completes, uh, the current is decreasing, so the magnetic field strength will be decreasing. And so Lenz's law says that the, uh, the loop's current is going to try to replace that missing magnetic field. So it's going to go, oh, come back, magnetic field, I miss you, which is a current in this direction. So this one is I counterclockwise. OK, so for the first bit, it's clock counterclockwise, and then it's clockwise, and then it's counterclockwise again. And the cycle repeats itself. So it goes counterclockwise, stop, clockwise, stop, counterclockwise, stop, clockwise, stop, etc. over and over and over for as long as the cycle continues. OK, uh, next question, 29.8. 21. <clears throat> uh, this question goes like this. A rectangular loop of length L and width W and an internal resistance of R is located in a homogeneous magnetic field of magnitude B. Blah. The area vector of the loop makes a 45 degree angle with the magnetic field direction. In uh, 40.4 seconds, the magnetic field completely reverses direction. What is the average current in the loop during this time interval? Well, that's a lovely question. Um, so let's start by drawing it. It's always helpful to draw it. Okay. So here's our loop, and um, this length here is 0 0.08 meters, and this part here is 0 0.06 meters, okay? And the magnetic field is doing a thing like this, okay? So the flux, because it's at an angle, the flux isn't going to just be the magnetic field strength times the area. Um, and so from the side, here's what it looks like. Here's our side of our loop. Um, we talked about the area vector. Remember area vectors from the start of the term when we were calculating flux? I'm going to draw the magnetic field going uh, straight up. 
because why not? So this angle here is supposed to be 45 degrees. Okay. So the flux is going to be the uh, the magnetic field strength dot the area vector. Or it's going to be the magnetic field, which is a function of time, uh, times the area times a cosine of 45 degrees. Okay. Um, now, the deal here is that the current is going to be the time derivative of the flux. Um, now, we need to calculate this as an average because we don't know what its rate of change is, but you know that it's the, uh, it's the final magnetic field, A cos 45, uh, minus the initial magnetic field, A cos 45, all divided by the time interval it took, which is 0.4 seconds. Okay, these aren't hard to calculate. Um, I can use my calculator to calculate the area. So the area is going to be 0 0.06 times 0 0.08. So the final magnetic field is minus 0 0.5 Tesla. Uh, the area is 0 0.0048. Uh, cosine of 45 is 0 0.7071. And then, uh, so this expression is this, and then it's minus, it's not minus, I guess I'll just write it on the next line. Um, it's, the magnetic field was originally pointing up at that strength, 0 0.0048 times 0 0.707, all divided by 0 0.4. All right, so that's um, okay. Uh, so that means that there's a voltage of zero point zero zero eight four eight volts on average, um, and then it said that there's a resistance. We want to figure out what the current is, right? Um, so there's a circuit, essentially there's an internal resistance. You can imagine the voltage is generated by a battery because why not? Um, and then, so we just use Ohm's law to figure out what the current is. The current's gonna be V divided by R. Oh, oh, 0048 divided by 20. So that's 0 0.000424 amps, which isn't very much, but you know, whatever. It's usually bigger uh, if you make more windings. That's why we make more windings in these cases. A single loop tends not to have all that much uh, induced uh, current. Okay. Uh, the next question we want to do is 29.23. Let's try that. A circular coil radius 30 millimeter or 50 millimeters rotates about an axis that's perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field of magnitude 0.5 Tesla. If the coil completes 60 rotations each second, how many windings must the coil have in order to power an appliance that requires an EMF that carries V max sine theta, where V max is equal to 155 volts. Okay, um, so there's different there's different parts to this particular question. Um, so in this question, they give you some aspects of the thing. They tell you that there's a coil and that's wound around a bunch of times. And also that the coil itself is spinning in an external magnetic field. Okay. 
Instead of giving you all the details and then asking you for what voltage it creates, this question is telling you um, what voltage it creates and is asking you to fill in the missing details. Um, so, <coughs> uh, the final answer that we were going to get, if we knew all the details, would be V max. Sorry, um, in this in the book at least it says one fifty five times sine omega t. Okay. So what do and don't we know about this question? Obviously, this question comes in a, in a couple different forms. We have to start by figuring out what the flux is as a function of time. And then once we find the flux as a function of time, the voltage is going to be the time derivative of that flux as a function of time. Okay? And so we'll figure out what this is, some expression for this, take its time derivative, set it equal to 155 times sine omega t, and then go on our way. Um, so the question here that we want to ask is, uh, what do we know about the system? Um, the flux is going to be like, uh, FYI, <laughs> the flux in this case is going to be, um, we can think about it in, in the following way. It's going to be the number of coils, the number of times the, the loop goes around the coil, like if it goes around 16 times or whatever, um, times the, uh, the area times uh, the magnetic field strength times, it's probably going to be like cosine uh, frequency time or sine. I'm going to set cosine because I want its derivative to be a sine function. But, you know, cosines are sine functions. They're the same shape. Okay, um, so the question here is, what do I know? What, which of these terms do I know? I obviously don't know this one because this is what the question's asking in the end. Uh, do I know what these other terms are? Um, so for A, uh, it tells me that it's a circular coil, radius point, uh, 50 millimeters. So the area is going to be pi r squared, pi times 0.5. It's 0.05. All squared. So the area of this loop is in meters. We want everything to be in meters, or meter squared rather. Meter squared. The magnetic field is 0 0.5 Tesla. That's nice. Uh, do I know how fast it's spinning? Do I know what omega is? And the answer is, it tells me some information here. It tells me the coil completes 60 rotations each second. Okay? Um, so the frequency here is 60 hertz. Um, so what would omega need to be for the thing to go around 60 times in a second? Well, if it goes 60 times in a second, then the period is 1 over 60. So the period is 0 0.01666 seconds. And so um, this expression here, cosine, it's probably 2 pi. In one period, it has to go from 0 to 2 pi. Um, so this is cosine, uh, <clears throat> let's see, 2 times pi divided by 0 0.01666. So that's 377.1 times t. Okay? So this means that the function, my flux as a function of time, is going to look something like whatever, whatever number of loops I have times this times this, times this. So let's write this out. 0 0.5 times 0 0.00785. 0 0.003925 times cosine 
377.1 times t. Okay. And the thing is, I've already been given um, uh, the answer, what the answer should look like. So I know that the voltage through this thing has to be that. Um, so I can take the time derivative of phi, and that gives me n times 0 0.003925 times 377.1 times uh, minus sine 377.1 times t. Okay? So we want all of this number to match that number. Uh, at this point in time, you might be like, hey, what about this minus sign? Uh, the deal here is that the sine functions and cosine functions and minus sine functions and minus cosine functions, they all have the same shape, okay? The only distinction between a sine function and a cosine function and a minus sine function and a minus cosine function is the phase. Uh, so all we really care about right now is the amplitude of this function. Um, so the amplitude here is going to be, well, just the absolute value of this whole thing. Right. So we want the absolute value of this whole thing to match the absolute value of this. Um, so, in other words, we want to make 155 equal to n times, I'm going to multiply those together, 0 0.003925 times 377.1. 1.48, uh, so the number of windings has to be 155 divided by that n lesser. 104.7. All right, so you need 105 windings. Ta-da. Okay. So uh, let's let's move on. Uh, the, the the fun and tricky part to this, uh, the the really interesting and fun and tricky part, is that when you take the it's the it's the flux, it's the change in flux through the loop, right? Uh, which depends on how strong the magnetic field is, and it depends on how strong the, how big the coil is. But it also depends on how rapidly things are changing. And in this case, how rapidly th things are changing depends on how fast you spin it. The same magnetic field and the same coil, the faster you spin it, the bigger the voltage is going to get. And the reason is essentially because of the chain rule. When I take the derivative of this expression, this thing comes out front. Okay? Which is fun because it means that you can generate a really high voltage peak, uh, maximum minimum voltage, just by spinning the same rinky dink whatever you have really, really fast. <coughs> All right, so that was question 23. Let's do 29.27. Let's see if anybody's looking at the thing. Oh, two people are watching. Hello. Uh, nobody said anything in the chat yet. Okay. Uh, 0.27. Oh yeah, I like this question. Ah! Oh, sorry, I just threw my Apple pen halfway across the room. Uh, this question goes like this. A very long cylindrical solenoid. So when you hear these words, a very long cylindrical solenoid, it means that we want to use the, uh, the ideal solenoid approximation. You assume that it's infinitely long. It has a radius of 0.5 meters and 1,000 windings per meter along its length. A circular conducting loop of radius 1 meters encircles the solenoid through the center of the loop with the area vector of the loop parallel to the solenoid axis. The solenoid initially carries a st steady current I, but the current is then reduced to zero during a 0.1 second time interval if the average EMF induced in the loop during the interval is 0.1 volts. What was the initial current magnitude? Oh, this is a great question. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to reproduce the, the diagram first in the book, and then we're gonna, I'm going to redraw it in a useful way. So here's your solenoid. Solenoids are fun to draw. Oh, I'm bad at it. OK. And um, around it is your loop. Okay, so, so, here's the idea. I'll just, I'll just schematically talk about the idea. The idea is you have current going through the wire, oh geez, I, 
okay? And that's going to generate a magnetic field in the solenoid. Because this is an ideal solenoid, the magnetic field through it is going to be uh, uniform, but it's all going to be inside the solenoid, not outside the solenoid, okay? So when this green magnetic field changes, when it goes away, the total, so there's going to be a part of this loop that has magnetic fields going through it, that part is going to change. The magnetic flux of that region is going to change, and as that magnetic flux changes, that's going to generate an EMF in the loop. Okay? Um, so, like, like I'd probably said before, the simplest way to start these questions up is to say, okay, here's the current as a function of time going through the loop, going through the solenoid, figure out the magnetic field in the solenoid, and then figure out the flux in the loop, and then figure out the EMF in the loop. The way this question works is, it's giving you all the pieces of information, but not in that order. So instead, what, what they say is, okay, here, we know the setup. We know the initial setup of the system. Um, what's the, uh, figure out how strong the, um, we know the setup of the system. We know over how much time the current goes away, so we know how much time it takes for this magnetic field to fade. Uh, if we then know what the EMF through the loop is, figure out the uh, figure out all of the initial information about the solenoid. So it's uh, it's fun. So to answer this question, let me start by drawing this in a slightly more straightforward way. I'm going to draw it from the loop face on. Here's our loop. Okay. Maybe I should have drawn it in red because it's the same color as the one above. I'll do that. So here's our loop. Loop. Okay. Here's our solenoid. And here's the magnetic field going through the solenoid. Okay. So the deal here is that we can use this if I knew what how, how the if I knew how strong this magnetic field was as a function of how much current there is, uh, then I could calculate the flux. I could calculate the change in flux, and I, and I could calculate how much current there was initially. So let's do it. Um, okay, so let's figure out what B is as a function of I first. I like doing this using the um, using Amperian loops, and I probably want you to be able to do it too. So it's helpful to learn this. You might at this point say, can't I just rely on the formula in the textbook? And I'm like, if the midterms haven't taught you anything, it should be that, no, I don't want you to just learn the, learn the formulas in the textbook. You have to be able to describe where they come from in order to use them properly. So we're going to use, um, we're going to use Amperian loops. Here's a nice Amperian loop. It has length L. Okay, and I'll make the circulation go in this direction. Cool. Okay. Um, so the total current crossing through is the number of wires. going to be the number of wires times uh, the current in those wires and that's going to be uh, the length of my thing times let's see it said it was a thousand windings per meter so these two numbers multiplied together tell me how many wires cross my loop times whatever that current is okay okay so according to uh, Coulomb's or Ampere's law The circulation is going to be um, is going to be uh, equal to the current crossing loop times mu naught. Um, so the circulation here is essentially there's the magnetic field inside uh, times L. They're in the same direction, so it's positive plus zero. 
because they're perpendicular on this leg of it, um, plus zero times L, because the magnetic field on the outside is zero, and so because it's an ideal solenoid, uh, plus zero because they're perpendicular is equal to L times 1,000 times I times mu naught. You cancel things out, and B is equal to 1,000 times mu naught times I. Okay, so that's how strong the magnetic field is, and I can use this number, to the, this expression rather, to now calculate uh, the flux in my loop. So the fun thing about this is that the loop here is one meter in radius. I guess I better uh, draw the radius better. I can draw it in black. Black's the color of geometry. So this distance here is one meter, and this distance here is 0 0.5 meter. Okay, so if I want to calculate the flux, the magnetic flux, which of those numbers do you think I should use? Which area? Should I use the area of the solenoid or should I use the area of the loop? It's going to be B times that area. So which one do I use? The answer is uh, I care about the flux to the loop, but outside of the solenoid there's no magnetic field, right? And so uh, do you want me to write that down? Maybe, maybe I'll write it down. B times area outside solenoid plus B in times area inside. And the idea here is that uh, there's lots of area outside the solenoid, um, but the magnetic field out there is zero times A question mark. Um, the magnetic field inside is going to be 1,000 mu naught I times uh, pi 0 0.5 squared. Okay. Now, um, now what, how do I use this to find I? Okay. The question explains that um, the current reduces from some initial I to zero. And in that time, in, uh, in delta T is equal to 0 0.1 seconds, it generates an EMF of 0 0.1 volts. Okay, um, so this is the average. That means we're not going to use the time derivative. Instead, we're just going to figure out the initial and final values. Okay, so the EMF is equal to IB final minus IB initial divided by delta T. Okay. Uh, the final flux is going to be zero. The initial flux is 1,000 times mu naught times pi times 0 0.5 all squared times i all over delta t. I guess that's supposed to be a minus sign. They didn't specify which direction this EMF was pointing, counterclockwise or clockwise. So the final expression I get is going to have a, a negative number in it. And that should be OK. So in other words, the EMF here is the absolute value, or rather the, the EMF I'm given is going to be the absolute value of this term. So just knock that sign off, it doesn't matter. 0 0.1 is equal to, and it happened over 0 0.1 seconds conveniently, um, and then this, this is 1000 times mu naught times pi times 0 0.5 all squared times i. So i has to equal <clears throat> 1,000 times so mu naught is equal to, there you are, 4 times pi times 1 e minus 7 times pi 
times 0.5 times 0.5. All right. So 1 divided by that number is 1013 amps. Okay. You see how that, that works? It's pretty fun putting all these different terms together. I really enjoy it. Okay, uh, so that was question 27. Now it's time for 29.28. Oh, weird. Uh, this question goes like, like the following. <coughs> the space to the right of the y-axis And this figure contains a uniform magnetic field of unknown magnitude that points in the positive z direction. As a conducting square loop placed in the xy plane oriented with its horizontal and vertical sides parallel to the x and y axis, moves to the right across the y axis at a constant speed of 2 meters per second, a 0.24 volt EMF is induced in the loop. If the sides of the loop are 0.3 meters, what is the magnitude of the electric field? And B, what's the what direction is the induced current in the loop? <coughs> That's a fun question. I love these questions. I don't know why there aren't more. So I'm just going to draw it out like this. You got a magnetic field that looks like this. And it's concentrated in this area. And so to the left of it, there's no magnetic field. I don't know how strong it is. Okay. And then I have a loop like this. And this loop has the side length um, 0.3 meters. It's a square. And all that X, Y, Z stuff, that, all that's saying is that the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, so it's, it's nice. Everything's cool. Uh, and then it's moving in this direction, 2.0 meters per second. Okay. So if the length of the side loop is blah, uh, and then we know the voltage generated is 0 0.24 volts. Uh, so that's the EMF. 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 Okay. Um, so again, this is one of these questions where they give you the endpoint and not all the initial details, and then you have to use, put it all together to figure out what the missing part, missing piece of information is. It's kind of smoky in here. I don't know. Hopefully everything's okay. Um, one, two, three, four. Oh, geez. So the computer. Oh no, no, everything's working. Okay, cool. So let's uh let's do it. Here's the fun part. Ready for the fun part? The deal here is the trick to doing these questions is uh, we want to calculate the flux again. Oh, geez. We want to calculate the flux as a function of time and then take its derivative, okay? I know. The deal here is, though, that the area exposed to the magnetic field changes. This is how the flux is changing. Only this part of the square has magnetic field inside of it, okay? So the height here of this part is 0.3 meters. This part has a length that's changing in time. Okay? So the flux is going to be the magnetic field strength times the area, which changes in time. So it's going to be the unknown magnetic field strength times 0 0.3, the height, times the length. Now this is the pink length, the part that's exposed. Okay. Um, I don't know what L of T is. I, actually, to be honest, it's not very, it's a constant velocity question. It's not very hard to come up with an actual formula of L of T, but I don't actually need to know what L of T is. Okay. Because watch, 
I'm going to take the derivative of phi to find the EMF. So uh, this is a constant, this is a constant, this thing is not a constant. So according to this, this is the constant multiple rule in, uh, in calculus, dl by dt. It's the speed that this side is increasing. How fast is this side increasing? It's increasing at 2 meters per second. B times 0 0.3 times 2. So um, the EMF is 0 0.24 volts. So 0 0.24 is equal to B times 0 0.6. So B has to equal 0.24 divided by 0.6. 0 0.4 Tesla. That's pretty strong. OK, uh, now the fun part. Uh, the fun part here is, which direction is the induced EMF? Well, so am I going clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, so the flux here is increasing, and it's the magnetic field going out, up. And so the loop, according to Lenz's law, is going to make a magnetic field going down to cancel out that increasing flux. Using the right-hand rule, I see that that corresponds to a current going like that, right? So the current is clockwise. Isn't that fun? That's a great final exam question. Uh, all of these are great final exam questions because they put in so much, so much different information. So if this was a super final exam question, what I might do is I might specify what the current is and the resistance. You would have to figure out what the EMF is and then uh, maybe maybe I would tell you what B was and ask you what V is. And you would have to put all that together. That's a spectacular final exam question. Because it puts all these things together, including stuff we talked about last term, you know, kinematics and stuff. Oh, I love this question. OK, um, so that was 28. Uh, oh, OK, so 29.30. Um, <clears throat> The coil in a generator has 100 windings and a cross-sectional area of 0 0.01 meters squared. If the coil turns at a constant rotational speed and the magnetic field in the generator is that of Earth, how many 360 degree rotations must the coil complete each second to generate a maximum induced EMF of one volt? <laughs> <coughs> All right, so let's specify what we're talking about here. Usually, uh, what we do is we, if we want to make a motor, we'll build a huge solenoid system and make a great big, not necessarily a solenoid, you can do it with a bunch of things. Cars use solenoids, though. You've heard of a solenoid in a car. That's what it does. Uh, there are solenoids that generate a big magnetic field. And then your generator -y aspect is a loop of coil that spins in between these. OK, um, so that's generally how how uh, generators work. Uh, this is how spark plugs work in your car. There's a solenoid that's generated by a battery. Your battery spins, uh, also has a motor attached to it that spins this. And that generates a huge changing uh, periodic EMF that causes the spark plugs to, to flip off. OK, so what if we don't? We mentioned that the uh, that the EMF generated in one of these generators depends essentially on three things. It depends on the frequency of your spinning. It depends on the area and number of windings in your coils. And it depends on the external magnetic field. So the issue here is, um, like, you can make a pretty big generator using whatever magnetic field you find. Uh, if area and the number of coils you're willing to make are large. The issue with these two, though, is that, like, I don't know about you, but, like, making a one meter tall spinning loop that spins really, really, really fast, that's, that's a feat of engineering. It's much easier to make smaller things that spin. Um, so in terms of engineering, the number of loops 
which determines the volume of the thing, and also the area of the thing are, are both limited. So because of engineering, A and N are going to be limited in size. Um, like I said before, magnetic field strength is is it's it's also kind of limited. Uh, if you're not going to make it using solenoids, you can use it using like rare earth magnets or even just like bar magnets. But essentially, B. And then if you want a really big magnetic field, you then have to spin it really fast. So in this question, uh, these two things are given, and they're given kind of realistic quantities, like the coil's centimeters, and then it's it's got 100 windings, which, I mean, is a lot if you have to wind it by hand. Um, the magnetic field is the magnetic field from Earth. So the Earth has a magnetic field. We've talked about it. We've talked about how it shields us from space radiation. It's pretty fun. Um, but it's not very strong. I mean, it's strong insofar as these things go, um, but it's not it's not strong enough to, like, you know, magnetize all the iron on the Earth. Well, it does a little bit, but, you know, it's not, it's not a tremendous magnetic field. Like, if you, if you carry uh, a, a metal wire around with you, you won't find, like, a huge gap difference between the, the potential difference on either side of the wire. It's not, it's not a huge magnetic field. So the question is, if we want to make a big EMF, how fast do we have to spin the system? So I'm going to draw it out, and then you can get a better sense of what we're talking about. So here's the magnetic field from the Earth. So this is B. <clears throat> um, here is our loop. So our loop here has area um, A is 0 0.01 meter squared and 100 windings. So it's like a loop 100 times the size in terms of the flux. So the max flux is going to be 100 times the area times uh, the magnetic field strength, 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. <coughs> so it's going to be 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, and then, so the flux is a function of time. It's going to be this number. That's the essentially the amplitude, 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 times, I don't know, sine of your rotational frequency times 2. OK. Um, I'm going to write this value as, um, that's, uh, omega is called the angular frequency. I'm going to write it like this, 2 pi times the frequency times t. We're going to get more used to using t and f uh, in, the, in the section we're currently doing, simple harmonic motion and waves. OK, so um, I want the time derivative of this. I want d phi by dt to equal 1 volt. That's the question. How fast do I have to spin it? What does f have to be? If you take that time derivative, you get 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 times 2 pi frequency times cosine 2 pi frequency times time. OK, so in order for uh, this, the maximum frequency, to be 1, these two uh, I'll need to kind of cancel out. So the frequency would have to be 1 over 2 pi times 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4. Let's use a calculator to calculate that. Sorry I'm sick. I realize I keep sniffling subconsciously. 3,183 cycles per second. That's a lot of cycles a second. Uh, let me Google how fast hummingbird wings be. Hummingbird wings. Uh, frequency. Okay, hummingbirds, uh, little hummingbirds, they're their wings beat 80 times per second. Um, 
what's what's frequency of uh, middle A? Okay, uh, the frequency of middle A is uh, 261 hertz. Um, Piano key frequencies. Yeah, let's look those up. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so, uh, okay, this is around the G, high G. Okay, so if you go to a piano and you go to like the G near high C, and then you go up three octaves, right? Uh, that's the sound this system would make as it spun. <laughs> it would be really high. This is a super high frequency. It's, you're probably not going to get it cycling that fast. I mean, I guess you could, but it would, it, would, it would be one of those systems where it spun so fast, you'd be like, it's dangerous to be around this thing. <laughs> it's going to tear itself to pieces. Okay, so B, based on this calculation, does it seem practical to use Earth magnetic field in electric generators? Uh, probably not. It takes a lot to spin something up that fast. Okay, uh, so that question was fun. It's important to have fun when you're doing physics. That's my philosophy. All right, last question. 29.37. Uh, this question is a three ball problem. I just thought I, it's been a while since I did a three ball problem on the feed. So you guys should see me get stumped once in a while. A bar is sliding along a connected set of conducting rails as shown in figure blah. The bar is given an initial velocity, vi to the right, and then allowed to move freely. The bar has mass m, and the distance between the rails, which is the length of the bar, l, uh, the resistance of the conducting loop comprising the bar and the conducting rails is r. Show the speed of the bar decreases exponentially with time, and determine the time constant. Nice question. <laughs> okay. Um, let's explain what's going on. So you got these rails, okay, and then you got a bar. Um, usually when we do these questions, um, usually when we do these questions, we're asking about uh, a constant velocity system. So I will usually draw like a donkey um, pulling, the, uh, pulling the bar at a constant velocity or something like that. In this case, the, the, the bar moves freely. Um, So you got this magnetic field. So let me just explain what's happening. Um, if the bar moves forward, that changes the flux in the in the in the in the loop, right? And so current's going to flow. You get a flow of current. Current's going to flow up and around like that, right? The current's flowing, and that means that there's resistance. <coughs> The system is losing energy. Where's that energy coming from? It's coming from the bar's kinetic energy. So we need to figure out a description of all of these different fun forces. Um, okay, that's fun. Um, so let's see here. Um, the bar has initial velocity vi to the right. Uh, mass m, and the bar length here is l. There's a resistance in it, r. Okay, so we know, uh, you know, if we did this in terms of forces, uh, we, we might be able to pull this off, but the issue here is I'm not sure about how much how much force there is as a function of time in this. I guess I could kind of calculate it, but it's kind of weird. What instead I know, though, is uh, the power, right? So the power is, power used is going to be the current in the bar times R. 
it's the power used uh, by electrons trying to push their way through this resistor system. Okay. And the power there is going to be the rate of change of the kinetic energy of the system. Okay, um, so what's the current? Uh, the current is going to be the EMF divided. Okay, well, uh, hold on, hold on. Let's talk strategy. Um, so here's the idea. I've got kind of, I'm going to try to use this equation as the basis for my differential equation. The kinetic energy of the bar is turning into heat, and so it's at this rate, and so it's losing this much kinetic energy. Um, so how do I, how do I do that? Um, well, I need to figure out what a bunch of these functions are as a functions of time. Maybe, uh, kinetic energy is a function of time. Maybe that. We'll see. So let me start by figuring out what I is as a function of time. So I need that as a function of time. This is a function of time. Eventually I'll get a differential equation. Uh, hint, it's going to be an exponential. Um, so... Oh no! Okay. So let's find I of t. I of t is going to be the EMF generated by the flux divided by the. Uh, and also, that's not the power. The power is going to be I times EMF. Um, so it's going to be the. EMF squared divided by the resistance. Let me write it like that. Sorry, I used the wrong equation. Okay, uh, so the EMF is going to be the rate of change of the flux, right? And the rate of change of the flux is going to be the magnetic field strength times uh, the length of the bar times the rate that the bar is moving down the tracks. So current velocity. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the kinetic energy is going to be one half mass up. The V V of the bar, T, all squared. Um, so let me take this derivative, I guess. I'll take this derivative. One half, oh wait, that M goes away. So it becomes um, M, these twos cancel, V is a function of T times A is a function of T. Wait, and I'll just write it as the der time derivative of V. Okay, good. So now I have an expression for this one and I have an expression for this one. Let me put the two of them together. This question, by the way, seems to me like it's gonna be a little bit hard to put this on a, on a final exam for you guys. I bet that if you took some, uh, some of the upper level physics students and asked them to do this, they would kind of choke and make some excuses Question's not easy. Okay. Um, so this equation becomes mv times dv by dt is equal to minus v squared l squared over rv squared. And now these v's are going to cancel out. Cancel this one with that one. And so it becomes dv by dt is equal to minus b squared l squared over r times m v. And this is an equation that has, it's, it's a differential equation, sure, but its solution is an exponential. You've seen that in your classes. It's going to be your velocity, your original velocity times e to the minus p squared l squared over r m times t. Yeah. <laughs> Show the speed of the bar decreases exponentially with time. Boom. 
uh, and determine the time constant. Uh, this is the time constant here. Uh, if you want to, you can talk it talk talk about it in terms of, of characteristic time. Um, so the time it takes to decrease by one factor of an exponential uh, is going to be t characteristic is going to be r m over b squared times l squared. <laughs> Let me talk about why this makes sense. Um, so this is like the amount of time it takes to slow down by a factor of two-ish, right? Uh, the larger the resistance is, oops. <clears throat> the larger the mass is, the more kinetic energy the thing has. And so the less it's going to slow down. So the larger the mass is, the more time it takes to slow down. That makes sense, right? The larger the resistance is, the less current is going to flow. Uh, it's going to make the same amount of EMF, right? So the power is the current times the EMF. So the more resistance it is, the EMF is going to be the same regardless, but the more resistance there is, the less current there's going to be and the less power it will drain. Um, B, on the other hand, is the magnetic field strength is what's causing this, this whole thing to happen in this way. Um, so the larger the magnetic field is, the more it's going to slow, the more current's going to get generated and the more it's going to slow down. The larger the B is, the more EMF is going to get generated and the more it's going to slow down. Similarly with L, this L plays a funny role. The larger L is, the more the, f the, more the flux is, the larger the flux is going to be. And so the, lar the more the flux is going to change as this bar moves down and the more EMF is going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I hope you had fun listening to my answer to that question. Uh, nobody's asked any questions. I guess my next office hours, my next online office hours is, oh, there's next week's. Uh, there's going to be an assignment next week on some simple harmonic motion stuff. Um, what I might do is I might make it so that next week's assignment isn't due for marks. Or maybe what I'll do, I haven't decided. When I decide, I'll put out an email. That seems like a good idea because I'm thinking on my feet as I speak right now. But what I might do is next week's assignment could be for marks if you want to do it. Um, no, no. What, what I'm going to do, well, um, what I'll do is next week's assignment won't be for marks, but I'll show you how to do it on the online office hours. And then after that, the next online office hours will be the solution to the practice final. Okay, that's it for me today. I hope you have... Nice day. I'll probably be doing online office hours even um, even during the final exams. Just one. I, I don't hold regular office hours, but it'll be handy for you guys to see me work through one of these finals. Anyway, I hope you had fun watching me solve the last one. That was a pretty fun question. If you, if you guys even wonder, like, you might be wondering whether or not you want to be a physicist. I have, I legitimately have fun doing these problems. When I was trying to figure out what kind of career I wanted to have, if I couldn't be a researcher physicist, because researching physicists, physicists, it's just, it's just really competitive. So I was like, yeah, maybe I should do something else. Uh, one thing I wanted to do is like answering questions like this is really fun. It'd be fun if I had a job where I got to answer questions like these. <laughs> so if you're enjoying how things fit together, if you're enjoying learning about things, maybe consider a role in physics. That said. If you don't enjoy it, you might still want a, a, a job in physics because I mean, there's lots of different types of physics. You could be an experimental physicist. <laughs> All right, talk to you later.